This is No Talking in the Library, Mentor Public Library's media podcast where we talk about movies, TV, comic books, pretty much anything we find interesting. Hi, I'm John. And I'm Meredith. And this is No Talking in the Library, coming to you today from the scenic beaches of the island of Themyscira. So, in honor of Wonder Woman, which I will have been out for about two weeks, I think, um, at the time of this posting, we wanted to talk about other examples of live-action female superheroes as a way of sort of giving other options of things to watch. But in preparing for this, uh, we discovered that there really aren't any good examples. Right. When people talk in the media about uh, Wonder Woman being unique, it's really true because there just haven't been that many instances of live-action, female-led superhero movies. So in the 100-plus comic book adaptations that have been made since probably the dawn of cinema, I think eight of them have been female-led, the last of which was 2005's Electra. And one could argue that Wonder Woman is only the second superhero film, the first of which being 1984's Supergirl, because the others that have been made have been more like anti-heroes or villains who sort of cross that gray line. There was 2004 Catwoman, which was just a mess for other reasons. Right, that Catwoman movie was deeply, deeply bad. Uh, And Elektra, it's funny, you know, I just, I rewatched it. We were talking about this uh, earlier on, and it's not as bad as I remember it. Yeah, it's just boring. Yeah, I mean, it's really, Jennifer Garner was not very well cast in that movie, and as you were saying earlier, she's not really a hero per se. I mean, she's a character that came up in the Daredevil main line, and she's a female ninja assassin type, not a good person really by any of the stretch of the imagination, and someone who really in the Daredevil comics really walks the line. And sort of it, that movie came around kind of after the, the Daredevil movie that had happened a couple of years earlier, I think. And the the sort of premise is that she's this kind of like assassin with a heart of gold or whatever. Yeah. And Catwoman was a mess. It didn't really adapt the Catwoman comics. It was like, they're like, we want to make a movie about Catwoman. And what the person heard was cat and woman. And then gave a woman cat powers, which right. is not really, she's a cat burglar. <laughs> right. And other like cat quality. I mean, isn't there some sort of scene in there where she's like scarfing tuna or something yeah, it's like just, that? It's really bad. Um, then there were a few in the 90s that were adapted from like indie comics. There was 1995's Tank Girl, which, which is good. But when you think about superhero movies, in my mind, they need to actually be able to be watched by kids because ultimately... Like, these superheroes need to be inspirational for someone who's, like, eight years old. And an eight-year-old can't watch Tank Girl. Right. I mean, I will say, we'll talk about Wonder Woman. I mean, we have a lot to say about it, believe believe me. But we want to sort of focus on things that are out now and available through the library, not surprisingly. Uh, so we're, we're not going to talk about that really until it comes out on DVD. But I will say that when I did see it the other day, I saw it in the theater with me was a was a, about 10 or 15 uh, junior high school age girls who were really loving it. And then when I came out, they were all taking selfies of themselves uh, next to the life-size cutout of Gal Gadot in the lobby of the movie theater. So one of the things that that movie really did was it knew who its target audience was and it really played to them very successfully. So as John and I were discussing in order to prepare for this, we really realized that there aren't really any movies that one could recommend as being like a good female-led superhero movie um up until this point women have just been better served as action heroes or comic book adaptations on television we've talked about supergirl here i think a couple of times um and that's a good example and there have been other comic adaptations with really great female characters, but they have been, you know, up until this point, limited to television. Uh, 
One way I thought we could approach this was by talking about the ways that the roles that women played in television changed in the course of the 1970s and 1980s. And if you look at women in television, starting in the sort of golden age of television uh, in the 1950s and 60s, that they really are limited to very domestic roles. I mean, the sort of June Cleaver figure is, is really defines the role that women play, the sort of wife and mother, housewife type character. And in a way, that's not surprising, given the what the sort of what American society was like at the time. I mean, this is the post-war boom when one income will allow a whole family to survive and prosper. And so you get this figure of the kind of non-working housewife, which was a much more limited figure before before the Second World War. When you get into the 1970s and you start getting cultural outgrowth, so to speak, of the women's liberation movement, the, the feminist movement, you start to see women playing other roles. The first one that I could find, and you know, if anyone out there hears this and, and knows differently, feel free to tell us, but was the show Police Woman, which aired from 1974 to 1978. It starred Angie Dickinson as an undercover police officer. So this is the first time you see a woman really in that kind of police officer role, which had been exclusively male up to that point. Uh, right after that, starting 1975, you see the Linda Carter-led Wonder Woman series, and that's really the first time that you get a sort of prime time major network, I mean, in those days, major networks was pretty much all there was, show uh, centered on a female comic book character. Uh, and it's a really interesting show. I mean, I know that I know that you were rewatching some of that, and I, and I did as well. Yeah, and up until just this year, or I guess technically, Batman v Superman, Gal before Gal Gadot, like Linda Carter was the only other live action Wonder Woman. And that's crazy when you think about how many different men have played Batman and how many different men have played Superman to be like the only other version of Wonder Woman or the only version of Wonder Woman was Linda Carter for how many decades? Right. And she really, I mean, it really defined her career. Uh, you know, for, for 20 years, if you said Linda Carter, the first thing come into people's minds was Wonder Woman. And she really played, I mean, Wonder Woman is really, the show is really interesting for a lot of reasons. One is that, you know, it starts out being set in the 1940s and then moves to the 1970s. <laughs> when it switched networks. It switches networks, <laughs> but with all the same cast and characters. He was... I mean, Steve Trevor was his own great grand nephew or something. Right, yeah, they finessed that somehow. <laughs> but also it's worth noting that uh, Linda Carter was a pretty standard-looking model-type woman in the sense that she didn't, she wasn't really buffed up in the way that, say, Linda Hamilton was for the second Terminator she movie. She was like a Miss Arizona or something, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, okay... Wonder Woman is strong and powerful because she's related to gods, basically. Right. But the fact of the matter is, it was a little weird to see her in this very sort of... She wasn't super muscly in the way that... I mean, this is a, this is a real difference with Gal Gadot. You look at Gal Gadot, and when she's holding a tank in the air, <laughs> you could really believe that she could do it because she's really... She's very fit. The original series is kind of... I mean, I really see it in a way as... An important moment, although it's it's super campy and it's a little hard to watch yeah, right now. Yeah, it's definitely a product of its of its era, and it's kind of entertaining to watch for like comparison's sake. But so, I mean, another interesting thing is that right after that, the next year, 1976. So, Wonder Woman premiered in 1975. 1976, you get uh, the Bionic Woman, which was a sort of spin-off of the Six Million Dollar Man, uh, which was very a very popular show at that time starring Lee Majors as an astronaut who has a horrific wreck and gets bionic uh, legs, a bionic arm, bionic eye. Then they bring around the bionic woman, which stars Lindsay Wagner as a sort of former tennis player, who's a teacher. She has this parachuting accident. She gets bionic legs, a bionic arm, and a bionic ear. And it's, it's actually a really good show. I really have to say that uh, it holds up a lot better than a lot of TV from that era frankly. Uh, Lindsay Wagner, I think, is a really great actress. And also, they made her a little bit more empathetic than, than the Six Million Dollar Man was. And partly that's because of the prejudice of the writers who assume that women are naturally more empathetic, which turns out is not true, but that's another issue. Uh, but really, so the character has a lot more depth than the, than the sort of Six Million Dollar Man character off of which it was a, a sort of spinoff. 
So then you get into the 80s, and I feel like television kind of moved away from those genre TV shows. It was very much like police dramas and sitcoms. Right. So you see a lot of Cagney and Lacey police officer deals and... Right. I mean, Cagney and Lacey is remarkable in the sense that the 1980s, in a way, is a sort of uh, moment when police dramas get a little grittier. So you have Hill Street Blues, which is a lot grittier take on what police work is like than, than had been, I think, previously available. But you get Cagney and Lacey, who are police, New York police officers, and, and it really they really deal with some different kinds of things. I mean, the, I think Lacey has like a really horrible drinking problem over like one or more seasons, and uh, they try and sort of show them once again as being more empathetic, which in part is a kind of reflection of writer prejudice, but in part it's also something that makes the characters a little deeper, in fact, than in some of these other shows. Yeah, but you weren't seeing like comic book, I think, adaptations right. during that time. But then when we get into the 90s, there's another sci-fi boom right? with, I think, Star Trek. Yeah, coming, Star Trek The Next airing. Generation starts in the, in the 1980s, in the mid-1980s. And, you know, it should be said, too, I mean, one of the shows that, that, that we sort of passed over here is, is Charlie's Angels, which is an important show in the respect that the characters in Charlie's Angels are all police women who, who qualify and are very sort of qualified for the job and then get stuck answering phones or doing sort of stereotypical women's work and so go into sort of private whatever. But that's a really, it's a, it's, it's a show or it's a model that's not really followed out very much. So you're right. I mean, we go through the sort of 80s where it's the sort of era of the sitcom. And then we get into the 90s where there's much more of this sort of sci-fi TV. Uh, yeah, there was the whole like first run syndicate like moment where... So there's this whole first run syndicate boom where they're making these like cheap sci-fi productions out of New Zealand. Right. One of which was Xena Warrior Princess, which is it was huge. <laughs> right. Lucy Lawless, uh, a really you know a really entertaining show and one that was uh, interesting for a whole lot of reasons. I mean the relationship between her and. Um, her sidekick, Gabrielle. Gabrielle, was a more developed uh, relationship between women than you saw on most of these shows. And also, I mean, she really you don't really, up until that point, see a character like her, like Xena, who really doesn't take anything from anybody. I mean, she's really, you know, I'm going to stab first and ask questions later. My favorite part of that show is the blatant disregard it has for history or continuity or anything. Right, yeah. I mean, it was so true of, of, of a lot of those shows, too. I mean, really, at the same time, there was that um, Babylon 5, which was a kind of knockoff version of Star Trek or whatever, uh, that had some impressively important female characters, but was still a lot like the original, I mean, the original Star Trek. It's really kind of funny that then sort of two shows down the line, you get Star Trek Voyager with Kate Mulgrew as the first female starship captain. I mean, if you guys can think of a female starship captain in any other show uh, that happens before that, please email us because we, you know, I've been racking my brains for days and I can't think of one. So I want to actually talk about good examples of adept female comic book characters that have been adapted and I think the best examples of that um, are from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Agent Carter which are two ABC productions in the Marvel Universe and they Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in particular does I think a really good job establishing and developing its female characters. Yeah I agree I mean they started out in just sort of the basic team with Agent May who is played by Ming-Na, who's a very uh, well-known actress. She'd been on several seasons of ER. She'd been in um, Stargate Universe, the sort of uh, spin-off of Stargate SG-1. Uh, and she's a very hard-nosed character, very intelligent character, 
really key to the storyline, uh, really gets developed in interesting ways. And then a couple of seasons in, you get Mockingbird. Oh my God. So Adrian Pilecki plays Bobby Morse, who is also known as Mockingbird. And it's really interesting to note, Adrian Pilecki was cast as Wonder Woman in the failed Wonder Woman TV show. So this is not the much talked about Never Happened Joss Whedon project. Right, that was not the Joss Whedon movie, right. but they actually shot a pilot for oh, that's right. a that's Wonder right. Woman TV show starring Adrian Plecky. I think some, if not all, of the pilot is on the internet, and right. you can see her in her, it's like a pants, it's based off of, I think, the 2010 brief reboot before the new 52, where she's wearing, like, what looks like plastic pants. Right. <laughs> um... But Adrian Pilecki plays Mockingbird, and she's both a biologist and kung fu master, and she does such a great job. Adrian Pilecki, who was in Friday Night Lights prior to this, like, I thought was okay right. in that. I didn't really think that much of her, but she does such a great job. Right, it was much better than her on fire on the ceiling <laughs> in the first episode of Supernatural. Supernatural. <laughs> yeah, she does. Uh, they really, they wrote her very well. They paired her with Nick Blood as... Uh, Hunter, a sort of British male secret agent to whom she is is notionally married. And the the interplay between them is really excellent. They wrote Mockingbird as a as a as a character with some real depth. Uh, She's some of the most like badass fight scenes in I think the all of it. Right. Um, I mean the whole the whole uh, scene where she has to rescue Agent Simmons. That's from, one of my favorite scenes, which he has to rescue Gemma from the Hydra right. facility. There's a there's a whole sort of beginning of the season, I think it's season three maybe, yeah. where uh, Gemma Simmons, who's another really interesting female character, I think, uh, interesting for kind of different reasons. Uh, she's uh, gone undercover in Hydra, and she has to be extracted, and all of a sudden it turns out that uh, Mockingbird is sort of introduced because she's a kind of... Uh, she's also in deep cover, and she, her cover has been as a kind of enforcer for Hydra, who Gemma thinks is going to kill her on a couple of occasions. And then she has a series of really awesome fight scenes on the way out. I mean, it's just, it's really it's so well done uh, and so unexpected. I mean, really, there's some really good moments for women agents in the Marvel Cinematic Universe generally, I think. I'm, I really like the sort of moments when Black Widow shows up uh, her little thing in in the in the second Iron Man movie is really good. Her her bit in the Captain America Winter Soldier is I mean Captain America Winter Soldier I think is my favorite of all. Yeah, I like anytime Kobe Smolder shows up as Maria Hill is always a good time. Right, yeah. Kobe Smolder's a great actress. They write her with this really snappy dialogue. There's a sort of point at which when they're kind of facing off with Grant Hill, he makes some really snarky remark about about Kobe Smulders not being as attractive as Black Widow, and Kobe Smulders says something like, yeah, that's great, I'll tell her the next time I see her, which is a really serious threat to deliver to somebody since Black Widow is, you know, a total, you know, coffin salesman. So um, so then you have Agent Carter, which was a short-lived series with Haley Atwell, who we know from Captain America, the first Avenger. They gave her her own series post um, Captain America, where she's working for not shield the precursor to shield the ssr ssr and Haley atwell that show is like is one of those shows that i recommend with a caveat because it's like Haley atwell is so good as peggy carter and she loves playing peggy carter so much but the show itself is like so hit or miss Right, it could have been. It's one of those things that had a lot more sort of promise than execution. It's she really she really loves playing Agent Carter. You could tell there was a certain point in sort of late in the second season or right around the time they did the second season when it became clear that she was going to get uh, another show on a major network, and so it became clear that she wasn't going to do a third season of Agent Carter. And she was really sad about it. I mean, it was. And the sort of interesting contrast here is to between her and Jamie Alexander, who plays Sif Lady from Sif. the Thor movies, who you can tell does not like dressing up in a costume. Right, and and she was on that. She got a show, and she just I mean, never a, looked back. Right, yeah, and it's a pretty successful show. You know, whatever. I I, I have no. 
I don't begrudge Jamie Alexander success, especially. I mean, I do because I love Sif. So. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Jamie Alexander, you need to be Sif. <laughs> well, I mean, I. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me that like you aren't Sif, but that that's a whole other issue. But I really feel like the Marvel Cinematic Universe has did a, done a pretty good job with this, and the the Agent Carter thing is, I think, a really interesting one in the respect that she wasn't a real character. I mean, she's a sort of aggregate of of other characters in a way, unlike say Black Widow. It's a character that came up through the mostly through the Daredevil comics, but they really uh, took an opportunity to make this character. And the key thing you got to know about Peggy Carter is she's the one who is the founder of Shield. So if you look at all the things that grow out of the whole Shield architecture, they trace back to her. There is a really awesome episode of Agents of Shield which has a Peggy Carter flashback in it. And Gemma, who is the scientist character and who's who's British, so she has this fangirl um, feeling for Peggy Carter, and they find a document, I think, and Gemma mm-hmm. sort of like Peggy Carter held this in her hands, and it's really it's it's fun the way that at least the TV shows sort of play off of each other. Yeah, Agent Carter. Uh, one of the really fascinating things about it too is that sort of they have it set so you first see her in uh captain america the first avenger uh as a sort of as an element of the story of steve rogers becoming captain america and they fall in love and then there's this very moving scene sort of toward the end where or at the end where captain america has managed to kind of hijack the hydra bomb plane and he realizes that he's going to have to take it into the ocean and he's just going to die and there's this very sort of touching scene between them uh, over the radio and it really works because they've established this relationship between the two of them where it's one of a real mutual respect it's not that Captain America sees her as a kind of helper to him Captain America sees her as being exactly on the same level of, as, as he is and as having different kind of capabilities that complement his own and his capabilities complement hers. So it creates a sort of interesting backstory that kind of flows into different parts of the of the elements of this Marvel Cinematic Universe that happen afterward. Yeah, that's probably the major theme that runs through Agent Carter. It's a few years later, the war's over, and Peggy's trying to reestablish herself in this um, agency, and the men sort of expect her and the other women to go back to the household now that the war is over and Peggy doesn't want to do that she she knows that she's a good agent I believe she says directly I know my my worth or I know my value or right. something like that I don't need a congressional honor I don't need agent Thompson's approval or the president's I know my value anyone else's opinion doesn't really matter so that's really what what the show is about it's about Peggy Carter you know, fighting against the system that's designed specifically to keep her down, her and other women. Yeah, I mean, they're always sort of telling her to go get coffee. Tea. Tea I think there's an amazing scene where she uh, feigns women's troubles to go do a secret investigation. Right, and when that phrase is mentioned, like, all the men in the room immediately, like, go, 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 go. So Peggy has this really... Uh, awesome friendship with Howard Stark's butler Jarvis and you know he's got some of the same issues because his wife is Jewish I believe and like a former member of like Czech commando yeah. or something like that so he also or understands um, you know what it's like to you know have the system right he know. say he rescued her and then yeah. he got court martialed for doing it and you know, too, the, one of the scenes, the, the really best episode, I think, of, of that entire show is the one where they infiltrate into Russia and they end up going to what is essentially the Red Room. The Red Room is a kind of uh, Soviet assassin training school, which is where uh, Black Widow was trained. And uh, she infiltrates it with an agent from the agency who has never seen her really operating. But she also ends up hooking up with the Howling Commandos again, who are the the group of soldiers who formed around Captain America during the war. And it's it's really startling and really awesome to see all of a sudden she gets back in this 
mode of how she was as an operator during the war. And there's a whole scene where they're going through the building and Dum Dum Dugan, the leader of the Howling Commandos, has her on point, which tells you everything you need to know about the kind of confidence that he has in her because you can't have someone on point who's going to get killed and immediately you know, compromise everybody there. So if he has that kind of trust in her, I mean, there's a moment where the agent kind of realizes, hey, she's in a whole other category of, of skills than, than I ever realized. And that's something that, that the show, I think, does really well. Yeah, so there's also, like, really great fight scenes set to, like, big band music, which is always fun, and she faces off against a few female villains, which is cool. In the first season, there is a early black... They don't say specifically that this character is a black widow, but you're given a lot of signs that this character played by Bridget Reagan um, came out of that, that Red Room facility and then in season two there's madame mass because the show moves to hollywood land and she's this actress who's sort of i think aging right out of the hollywood system um so that's really really interesting as well um i like it when the shows they're doing it on the supergirl too that they pair their female characters against sort of powerful female villains which which is fun. Right. I mean, one of the kind of cool things about the this first season especially, I mean, this happens a bit in the second season too, is that they play on the fact that men systematically discount the possibility that women could be powerful in any way. And so this, this kind of Black Widow character is allowed to uh, do a lot more damage than she otherwise might because all the men around look around like, well, it couldn't be her. Like, it's got to be, there's got to be some guy running the show here who's, who's doing whatever. So we have Agent Carter and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. here on DVD, so it's definitely something, if you liked Wonder Woman and you're looking for other, you know, good examples of of strong female characters, uh, unfortunately you're better off looking towards the small screen, at least for right now. Um, 2019 may bring us... Uh, Brie Larson is Captain Marvel, but I don't know if anything will happen. Right, they've announced that, and I would absolutely love it. Isn't 20, isn't that... Isn't that around the time that we're supposed to also possibly, I mean, there's talk now, it's early days yet, but of getting another Wonder Woman movie. uh, The Wonder Woman, I think, did something like... $103 million or something. In its first... In domestic. Right, I think maybe somewhere close to $200 million worldwide in its first weekend, which is... I mean, it's really great in the respect that, uh, and I know we've talked about this a lot, There's this sort of idea that's put around that the reason that they don't do these female-led movies is because it's a gamble or whatever, you know, like. And in a way, you can kind of see why TV would be the place where it would happen a little more often because you do a TV show, it's generally going to be a lot cheaper. Uh, You do it sort of on spec. They air a couple of episodes, and if it goes nowhere, they just stop. Whereas if you've put out, I mean, Wonder Woman costs $125 million to make. So that movie, that money is all gone now uh, once you've made it so you need to be have some sort of idea that you're gonna you're gonna be able to make it back it's clearly the case that men who make gigantic flops get a lot more chances than women yeah, who make gigantic Ryan flops. Reynolds has played I think three different superhero characters right yeah like a proto Deadpool and the Wolverine origins and played Hal Jordan in the Green Lantern flop, and yet they still give him (laughs) another go. Yeah, I mean, the woman who made Gates of Heaven, I think, or the, or no, the woman who made Ishtar, the the Warren Beatty, Dustin Hoffman movie, which is often talked about as one of the biggest flops ever. I don't think that's quite true, but she never directed again, ever. I mean, that was it. So it's pretty clear that this movie getting some traction was an important thing for movies centered on women, movies directed by women, getting more play going forward. Yeah, it definitely gives me hope. The the movie was so solid that it seems crazy for them to to not make another. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see. When we get around to talking about this movie, like, I mean, in a way it's like good that it's not going to happen for a couple of months so we can like take a breath because I think yeah. we were both pretty like breathless after after we got done watching this one. Well, I think that's uh, about all we have for today. Uh, Thanks for listening. Thanks.
No Talking in the Library is a production of Metro Public Library. Opinions expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily express those of the library or the library board. You can find our webpage on the library's website at www.metropl.org slash adults slash no talking. Our sound editor is Marilyn Wiest. Our webpage is maintained by Mary Pelton. <laughs>